Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Psachim Daf Kuftet Zayin. So we're going to start at the third line. Okay, we're getting really into the Seder itself. We're going to talk today about Magid and telling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. That's the part right after we do Kiddush, and then we talked about Orchatz, washing hands, which today we'll get back to that. We had this whole question yesterday about, um, about the Haroset. It seemed liquidy. So today we're going to get our answer to that question because we didn't really understand. Haroset is not liquidy. So today we're going to see why Haroset is not liquidy. Um, we're going to talk about is Haroset a mitzvah or not. If you remember, we talked about in the Mishnah, is Haroset a mitzvah, is it not? So we're going to finish up with that. And then we're going to get into the next section, which is all about Magid telling the story. Um, so now let's start from, and we talked about yachatz yesterday, about the the, um, the ani prusa, right? That the idea that we do a piece of the bread, that we eat it like that, and that's why we break the matzah. So now the Gemara says, starting from afal pisha haroset mitzvah. Okay, I'm just reminding everyone, if you haven't registered for the Seder, for the um, Siyum next week, please register. I really feel like while we're learning these dapim, it's like our prize at the end of the Masechet to get to these fun, sugiot, interesting to kind of shed light on all these things that we do and we know so well, right, as opposed to all the parts about korbanot, sacrifices that we really didn't know well at all. And here it's kind of like the, the prize at the end of the Masechet, you get these great dapim, which are all relevant and teach you about all sorts of things that go on that you never really necessarily thought about. So So one of the opinions in the Mishnah was Kharosa is not a mitzvah. And then Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Tzadok, if you remember, it said they bring before him the matzah, the charosa, the chazeret. Even though charosa is not a mitzvah, they bring it anyway. And then Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Tzadok says it is a mitzvah. So ilo mitzvah mishum maitela. If it's not a mitzvah, then why do we bring this? It's because of the kappa. That's why we bring it. That goes back to what we saw yesterday. I looked up kappa a little bit more. So there's a bunch of different explanations about kappa. Some actually say it's an evil spirit, which is actually going to make sense in light of what we're going to see today. Um, so that, and the idea is if you dip it in karoset, well, that keeps away the evil spirit, um, which then reminds us of all the dipim we saw a few days ago. Again, some people say it's either some worm or maybe it's poison. It's just like a poison in it. Like there's something very sharp in the in the chasa, in the in the lettuce. And when you dip it in the charoset, it takes out that bitter sharpness, which they claimed was poisonous. So now, Amarabi Ami, so the reason is it's not a mitzvah, but we do it because of the kappa. In other words, there's no way to eat it without dipping it in the charoset. And that's why we do it. Amaravasi, now this is just good information in case you're worried about the kappa. So kappa de chasa chama. Another thing you could do for chasa, if you want to get rid of this kappa, again, whatever this kappa is, then you eat a radish. Kappa de chama, if you have kappa in a radish, karte, you eat leeks. Kappa de karte chamime. If you have in, in uh, leeks, then it's chamime, it's hot water. And then they say, well, by the way, here's another solution. This sounds very similar to all those Gemara's we saw, right? If you have this problem, this is what you should do. And if you can't get rid of it that way, get rid of it this way. It's the same kind of thing. For everything, really, you can use hot water. Now, if none of those work or you don't have an option for any of those, now we're getting back to the incantations that you say. And that's why to say it's an evil spirit actually makes a lot of sense. Kappa, kappa, de chir no lacho, the chef, but no techo, the tamne kalatech. It's kind of funny, the chisha um, incantation. Kappa, kappa, I know you and your seven daughters and your eight daughters in law. Okay, I know you well, you don't scare me. Okay, again, these are things that seem psychological, right? If you say this kind of thing, even I saw in a commentary, you know, this is clearly mumbo jumbo. This doesn't really mean anything. What, he has daughters, daughters in law, and others. What are we talking about? But the idea is you say something that maybe gives you strength. I can handle this, right? I can handle anything. Right? You ever try to talk to yourself when you're struggling through something? You say, you know, you could do it. You could do it, right? Maybe it's kind of way of, of getting over it. Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Tzadok, Omer Mitzvah. He says it's a mitzvah. So my mitzvah, and this is going to sound a lot more familiar to us, right? The kappa was maybe less familiar. If you never learned Arve Psachim, you might not have known this. But this is something we learned growing up as children. You know, this is what Haroset is for. So maybe you learned both. Maybe you learned one of them. We'll see. My mitzvah. Rabbi Levi Omer, Zecher Latapuach. For Rabbi Yochanan Omer, Zecher Latit. So one says it was because of the Tapuach. What apple was there in Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Well, we saw a little while ago about the Nashim, Afen Yubo Toanes, and we said, according to the Rashbam, they were the leaders. How were they the leaders? Because under the apple trees, they seduced their husbands. And therefore, 
it's the apple tree that saved the Jewish people. So the haroset is to remember the apple tree, and that's why we put apples in our haroset. Rabbi Yochanan says, no, it's zecher latit, it's for the cement. That's why the haroset has a cement-like texture to it, because it's zecher latit, the cement that they use for building. Now, these are two very different answers. One is talking about on what schut did we get redeemed, right? What merits did we have? That, and how do we keep the Jewish people going, right? Because of those women. The second one is because of the slavery. It's more remembering how bad slavery was. So I'm all by. And here comes our line. If yesterday our haroset was liquidy and we talked about you have to wash because there's liquid on it. Now Abai says, you have to also make it chamutz. Um, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word. Chamutz, um, like vine- you know, to add vinegar is chamutz sharp. You need to make it tart. That's the word. Thank you. You need to make it tart. And sarich samuche, you need to thicken it. And that's why it was liquidy originally. And maybe haroset is just a term for something we dip in. Okay, maybe it's not, um, maybe it's not, um, it's it's not what we think of haroset, right? We think of haroset because of the way they describe it. Haroset could just be any kind of dip. And to get rid of the, the kappa, so you need just some dip. But now we say, therefore, Abaya says, it has to be more tart and it has to be more thick. Sklekuye, tart, because apples are tart. Because cement is thick, right? And, and you know, samich, as they say in Hebrew. So Tani Kavate de Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're going to have a bright like Rabbi Yochanan. And we're going to add something else. Rabbi Yochanan said it was Zecher Latit, the cement. Tavlin, Zecher Lateven. The spices you put in it are to remember the straw that they also used. So now um, the straw. So now what does spices have to do with straw? So some people say we're talking about cinnamon sticks and, and uh, fresh ginger that you grate or you slice, you know, they're in like strips and therefore they look like straw, okay? Not crushed up tavlinim. Okay, I don't know if you do that in your, in your, uh, in your haroset, but according to this, that's how one should have spices in the haroset that are stringy and look like straw. Um, and haroset, why did we bring this brighta? Because not really because of the tavlin, but because of this line, haroset zecher latit. And here you have it like, um, exactly like, Rabbi Yochanan said, Amar Rabbi Elazar Rabbi Tzadok, Kach hayom rim tagrei charach shebiyushanaim, Okay, the short shopkeepers in Jerusalem would say, Bo utzlu lachem tavlin lemitzvah. Go buy, you know, they would say, Ah, oh, we're selling in the shuk, right? They always scream those things, Ah, oh, this, this, for that amount of money. So they say, you know, Everybody come, buy your spices for the mitzvah. What did they mean? They meant the haroset and the tavlinim that we just mentioned. Okay, Mishnah. Mazgulo kos shini v'kan haben shoel. We now move on in the Hagada. So now we get to the second cup. And as I mentioned, the Tosefta doesn't have this whole framing of all the sections by the cups. It just doesn't mention it. But in our Mishnah, each of the Mishnayot, it goes by, okay, now we do the first cup. Now we do the second cup. Now we do the third. So mazgulo kos shini, they pour the second cup. We don't drink it yet. V'kan haben shoel. And now the child asks the father. Now, here's a big question about how to read this Mishnah. So what does the child ask the father? It says here, the child asks the father a question. And if the child doesn't have knowledge and can't ask, then the father teaches him. What does the father teach him? So one way of reading this Mishnah is the child asks whatever the child wants. In other words, we already did. We gave the kid clayote and egozim, right? We gave him nuts and and roasted um, grains. And we picked up the table and we, right, we did all these things to get the child to ask. The ideal is that the child now asks, right? But according to this, so one way to read this is, and then the child asks, hopefully the child has a whole list of the child's own, own questions. But But if not, the father teaches him. What does he teach him? You might think the father just gives him an answer. No, the father teaches him how to ask. What does he teach him? How is this night different from all other nights? Right now, they're going to go into the four questions. So one way of reading it is, you don't have to say the four questions. It's just that if someone doesn't know, then these are the questions that we give him to ask. Another option is to say, no, the child asks questions. If not, the father teaches him to ask the questions. And here are the questions the child's supposed to ask. And if there's an actual text the child needs to ask. Now, to me, it seems... The first option, and why is that? Because in the time of the Mishnah, we've talked about this, tefillot were not set. 
They didn't have, right? We talked about the other day about the Havdalot. You say no more, right? No less than three, no more than seven. But it didn't tell you how many. It was something that there were basic general rules. You need this, you need that. We talked about it with Rosh, with Rosh Hashanah and the nine blessings in Musaf. You need Machiyot, and Shafarot. You need either three psukim or 10 psukim. But they didn't tell you which verses you choose. You chose yourself. Likewise here, tefillah was much more fluid. And this is a type of, it's, it's even more than a tefillah. You're supposed to tell a story. It's forget about tefillah. Tefillah at least is somewhat recitation, although it's not supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be you conversing with God. And here it's a parent conversing with their children. It should be a natural conversation about what happened. If you can't do that, right? And this is always an issue because at our seders, right? Part of it, we just recite, but that's not really the goal. The goal is not to recite. The goal is to enter into discussion and conversation. And that's what we're going to see throughout this Mishnah. So again, different ways of reading it. In fact, there's a third thing, which is not exactly parallel to those two, but there's another way of reading this a little bit differently than you would expect, which is maybe Manish Tana is the question. And the answer is, Shebechol halilot anu ochlim chametu matzah. That's, you, know, you ask, how is this night different? And you answer, well, on all other nights we do this. And this night is different. It's really more of an answer. This night is different because we do this and that, right? We do something different tonight than we do on all other nights, which would be a little strange because we're so used to thinking of them as four questions. But theoretically, one could say maybe that's answers. And what problem does that resolve? It resolves the problem that the child doesn't necessarily know that all these things are coming. These are questions not on the things we already did, like why did you give me klayot ve'egozim? And why did you just pick up the table? That would be the questions we more would expect that the child had already seen. But we don't know yet that we're going to dip twice. We dipped once, but we didn't dip twice yet. And dipping once, as we already said, was typical in their day. So there was nothing unusual about it. We haven't eaten matzah yet. So maybe the child knows we're gonna eat matzah, but right, we haven't eaten maror yet. So how does the child know all these questions? So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, okay, let's move on. Okay, again, this Mishnah can be read in many, many different ways. So that's why I want you to think about breaking out of what we assume to be the case. And the other thing we're going to break out of right now is that we always think about four questions and we talk about the four magic numbers. There's four questions, there's four cups, there's four sons, right? All the fours. But in fact, if you look at an old version of the Mishnah, and, and those in the skills class know this already, the Ketavia Kaufman, it's the earliest ver- written manuscript of the Mishnah, it only has three questions. It doesn't have the question of the Murrah. And the Rambam, in fact, has five questions because he has all the ones listed here and an additional one that we have in our Haggadah. Our Haggadah already replaced one of the questions with a different question because the question was no longer relevant. Questions have to be relevant. So we're going to see a few changes that these questions went through at, throughout the centuries, which shows that these questions aren't set in stone. So let's read. Manish tana alay laze mikol halilot. Shebechol halilot on all nights, anu achlim chametz umatzah. This should be easy. Most people know this. We eat chametz umatzah. Halayla hazeh kulo matzah. Okay, the main thing you're looking for here is differences between what it says here and what we say. So far the same. Shebechol halilot anu achlim sha'al riyavakot. We eat other vegetables. Halayla hazeh maror. Notice it doesn't say kulo maror because it's not kulo maror. We eat other vegetables also. We already learned that. So therefore it says we eat also maror, but not only maror, not like with matzah, which is only matzah. Shebechol halelot anu ochlim basar tzali shaluk umuvushal. We eat meat roasted, cooked thoroughly, or cooked regular. Halay lahazet. But on this night, we eat only roasted meat. Now, obviously, we don't have this question in our Seder. Why not? It's very clear. Because we no longer eat the sacrificial meat. Remember, the sacrificial meat had to only be roasted. And we don't anymore eat the sacrificial meat. And if you remember, right, even in the time of the Mishnah, when the Mishnah was edited anyway, when it was organized at the end, they weren't eating roasted meat either. Although we said that maybe some people still were. Remember, there was a minhag. Some people did eat roasted meat. Some people didn't eat roasted meat. We even said nowadays some people do eat roasted meat. Spartans sometimes do. Ashkenazim don't. Anyway, this question clearly over time got removed from our Haggadah because it was no longer the case, right? Even people who eat roasted meat, I don't think they believe that you have to only eat roasted meat, although maybe I'm wrong. Um, okay, so now, so that question obviously got replaced at some point. Okay, now here you already see, if you have a text in front of you from like the actual Gemara and the, the printed edition, there's parentheses, there's things, there's some problem with the girsa here. 
and you're going to see that the Girsa is different from ours. Shabachol halilot anu ochlin anu matbilin pam achat. We dip one time on all nights. Now, what we say is, on all of the nights, we don't even dip once. Tonight, we dip twice. But in the time of the Mishnah, they said, and we learned this already, that they normally dipped once. And the unique part was that they dipped twice now, right? Whereas nowadays, we don't dip at all. Wait till the Gemara. We're going to see that in the Gemara. And now, that, now we're done. What are they missing? The one about reclining. And that's because it was much more common to recline in those days. So it wasn't seen as something that was unusual or at least unusual enough, right? It could be not everybody reclined, but it wasn't unusual enough to add it to the list of questions. And when they took out the roasted one, it's very likely that they added in a different one in its place. And which one? The Misubim, because already people didn't usually recline anymore in those days. Moving on. So you've now asked the questions. Let's just assume this is part of the questions. So now, and now here comes the, right? Now we're going to, if you think about the Haggadah, the longest section of the Haggadah is Magi, right? We have the most text, the most things to say. And all the Mishnah tells us is teach your son according to his level of knowledge. That's basically, we're going to have a little bit more. And like, this is all of Magi in the Mishnah. Okay. So now. Again, they're giving you like a, a list of how to. This is what you should do. You should make sure to start with condemnation, like the bad. Okay, we don't, I'm going to say this very simply, okay? Because start with the bad and end with the good. So yeah, we can explain it in different ways. I want to be very general about it because it could be just explained as I see with your writing me disgrace. It could be explained as condemnation. You can explain these words in many different ways. It's unclear. Schwach could be praise but it also, they to translate as glory. So it's very, right, it's very hard to understand what even these words mean, okay? Gnud is always something in the negative place and shevach is something more positive. So again, I don't want to translate them so well because they can be translated in many different ways. Um, so that's matchil b'gnud m'sayim b'shevach, which sounds like, it's unclear. Does this mean begin the whole section of Magi with gnud and end the section with shevach? Okay, which you could say, how do we end Magi? We end with Hallel, which is praise. But we're going to see they don't really explain it that way. And what's interesting is when they have a debate in the Gemara about it, they debate the Gnut, they don't debate the Shvach. They don't even discuss it as if it's obvious. So we'll see when we get there and we'll discuss this a little bit more. I want to leave it open right now. And then here comes the main part. How do you tell the story? There's different ways you could tell the story. You could read it from Sefer Shemot and just read all the chapters and read what happened. But that's boring. People will fall asleep. So how do you keep people engaged? We want to take a short version of Jewish history, which where do we find? In Sefer Devarim, Perek Kavav, 20, chapter 26, it describes when the Jewish people would come to the land. They're supposed to bring Bikurim their first fruits. And when they go bring the Bikurim, they say this declaration. And it's a, a, a brief few verses of Jewish history, okay? Starting from Lavan and when Yaakov went to Lavan's house and then how they got to Egypt, how they went through slavery, how they got redeemed and then how they got to the land. And now that we've gotten to the land, we're bringing you from the fruits of the land. So now there's a few strange things. One is it says, and we don't actually finish the whole parsha because we end before the pasuk about and God brought us into the land. We don't say that verse. So that's a little bit strange. The Mishnah says, you say the whole thing, and we don't actually say the whole thing. And then, right, the issue is, why did they choose these psukim? And it seems that the better way to learn, and this again, as I say, is strange, because we often, what happened, again, it turned into a text that we recite, and we basically recite, okay, here's a pasuk, here's a drasha, here's a pasuk, here's a drasha. And we don't actually, many people don't spend a lot of time in the Seder on this, but this is the real place where we tell the story. Why did they choose to do it in this way? Because it's much more engaging. A drashot are more the world of questions and answers. There's a difficulty in the verse. What does that teach us? So we're going to have a discussion. We're going to use these psukim as a springboard to have a discussion about the whole story and get into a whole conversation about it. Unfortunately, over time, it turned into a recitation and people just recite these. And by the time they get there, they've already discussed the four sons and they've discussed the story of the rabbis sitting in B'nai Brak, and they've discussed... And we've gotten so sidetracked by all these extra things that were added to the Haggadah that this is the real meat and potatoes of the Haggadah and often people don't even spend time in it. So it's very important to keep that in mind in your Seder that the main 
structure that comes up. Okay, so let's just go through. We don't have halach ma'an yet, right? We don't, it, it's missing all these parts of it. And the main thing is this gnut and shvach, which we'll see in a minute what they are. Right? Questions, gnut and shvach, and the Arameo Vedavi section. That was, right, whenever you learn tefillah, anything like that, you have to break it down into what was the original, what was added later. So all these other things were added later, and that means that they're less significant. This is the main section of the Haggadah. Okay, so if I can have you something to come out with this about the Haggadah, is that's the part where you're supposed to go in depth about. So we'll get more back to this Gnut and Shvaf and what is it, and, and then that'll add a little bit more as to what's basic and what's needed. Again, the question is, is uh, Is that kind of like, this is how you get into it, like start with a little teaser, you know, or a little intro, this is how you do your intro, or is that also part of the central part, which might be? So it's a good question. Tanu Rabbanan. Chacham, so the Gemara starts off by quoting a bright. Chacham beno shoalo. Uh, sorry, Chacham Beno Shoalo. If the son is wise, then he asks the questions. Vimeno Chacham Ishto Shoalto. If your son is not wise and doesn't know how to ask questions, so your wife asks the questions. Vim Lav, who Shoal Asmo? If not, you ask yourself questions. Let's say you're sitting by your Seder by yourself. Happened to a lot of people last year. Might happen to people this year again. You're having Seder by yourself. It's also supposed to be in question answer format. It might seem a little bit strange but less strange in our time because the questions became more of a recitation and we just kind of recite them. But really you're supposed to think about the story in a question answer format because it's just a more engaging format even between you and yourself. Even two Torah scholars who know the laws of Pesach, they also ask themselves the questions, how is this night different even though they already know all the halachot. Now, this is a little bit strange. What does it have to do with knowing halachot? Shouldn't it be, even though they know the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, isn't that what the telling of the story is all about? Telling the story and not telling the halachot of Pesach? So I'm going to, those who did the skills class know this, that I showed some sources that show that there's two different tracts. In fact, the story of the rabbis telling the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim all night that we say in our Haggadah has a different version of that story with different rabbis, a different place. And that they were telling Hilchot Pesach all night. And some people think that the Sipur of Yitzhak Mitzrayim is actually telling the Halachot. And where does that appear in our Haggadah? In the answer they give to the wise son. They say, tell him Hilchot Pesach until Ad Emach Tirin Achar Pesach Koman. They tell him the Halachot of Pesach. That's the way they tell the story through the Halacha. So there were some people who thought the story should be told through the lens of Halacha, right? through the Hilchot Pesach, and through that you get to the story. Whereas others said, no, 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 this is not a, a night about telling halachot, there's a night about telling a story. It's not about halacha. So here you see this source clearly went in that direction that it's about telling halachot because even these rabbis who knew the halachot still need to do sipur yitziat mitzrayim. Shebechol halilot anu matvilim pamachat halayla zeshte pamim. Here you see that version that didn't really appear in the text by us, but that seems to be the version the Gemara had. Matkifla rabba. So rabba asks, um, Wait, this question assumes that every night we dip once. He says, I don't see us doing that. And this is a good example of when the Mishnah was written in Israel a number of generations before Rava, that was common what they did there. But he's living in a time where nobody dips once every night. It's not like everybody does that. So he doesn't understand the question. So Rava, so Rava changes it. Hachikatani, this must be what it meant in the Mishnah. He rereads the Mishnah through the lens of his own experience. It's clearly not what the Mishnah meant, but he changes it to read. And that's what, okay, we're going to see. It's not yet what we do. We are not obligated to dip even once. On this night, we're obligated to dip two times. To which Rav Chista responds, uh, Rav Safra responds, Elamar of Safra, Hachikatani. Uh, sorry, I skipped a line. Matkifla Rav Safra, Chiyuva Ledardike. Wait a minute. Why do we dip twice? We already learned, according to one of the opinions, right? If it's not because mitzvot, srichot kavana, we say it's so that the children will ask. In order that the children will ask, we can't call that a chiyuv. Like, let's say you didn't give klayot and negozim to your children. Did you not fulfill the mitzvah of the Seder? Of course you did. It's just a nice thing to do, but it's not an ob obligation. So he doesn't like Rav's wording of, we don't, we're not obligated to dip every day, ever on a regular night. And tonight we are obligated to dip twice. So therefore he says, 
It's not like it's an obligation to dip. It's just something we do. So therefore, Elam Rav Safar, Rav Safar changes it to what we actually say. Hachi Katani, this is what it says. Ein anu matbilin, afilu pamachat, halayla zeshte pami. And on all the nights, we don't dip even once. Tonight, we dip twice without the word obligation. Matchil bignut masayim b'shvach. Now we get to a very famous machloket. My bignut, what's the gnut? Rav Amar, mitchila of de avodal glilim hayu avotenu. In the beginning, our fathers were idol worshippers. Shmuel Amar avadim ayinu. Shmuel says it's we're slaves. So now, if we look at our Haggadah, how does it start? We have two sections. We actually do both Rav and Shmuel. We start with Shmuel, avadim ayinu. That's exactly how we start, which makes sense because it says matchil bignut. The gnut is the slavery. We were slaves. That was what was so, right? It was our, now we go back to the translation, our disgrace, right? It was disgraceful that we were slaves or it was painful for us, right? We described the torturous journey that we took. So that's the negative. Where's the pot? What's the shvach? It's the next line. And then God took us out. So we start with how things were bad, right? It's, it's like, um, I remember my kids had a, an English teacher and she always gave them these morbid stories. And I would say, why are you teaching them these? right? These kids are little, they're learning these terrible stories. She says, it's not an interesting story if there's not, you know, the evil guy and the bad thing that happens and it's just not interesting. So yeah, you can't just say, okay, God took us out of Egypt. That's very nice, but you have to understand where it came from and why it was so important that God took us out. So it needs to be in a context. So that's why you start with that. According to Rav, it's first we were idol worshipers. He goes back. He goes back. This is um, a professor of mine in Jewish history, Professor Yerushalmi in uh, Columbia University. He I remember he, we started a course in modern Jewish history and he said, you can't start from, you know, the Holocaust or from the creation of the state of Israel. You have to go back. It's all viewed in a context. You can't just start with the Avdud of Mitzrayim. You have to see what caused the whole thing to happen. You have to go all the way back to Terach Avi Avraham, who was an idol worshiper. And then we say, now again, the Shvach is going to come immediately. What do we say in our Seder? Mitchila of Dea Vadag Lilima Yoavotenu, or of Dea Vadaz Hara, there's different versions. They were idol worshippers. Vachshav, Kervano Amakom, Lavodato, and now God brought us under his wing. Okay. And therefore, we again, the Shvach comes immediately. It's not like we spend a long time describing that, right? It seems like the Shvach is immediate, even though you don't notice in the Gemara, they don't tell you what it is. And by the way, it seems like when they say these words, right? It, they know what the section means, or, or maybe they're just giving you a concept, and then it, it eventually turned into the text that we say. Um, and obviously, people talk about what's the difference between them. One is physical, one is spiritual, right? The physical, right? I gave one difference of, you know, the perspective, but there's also the physical versus the spiritual, right? Being connected with God and idol worship rather than the actual physical slavery that we endured. Rav Nachman says to his Eved Daru. Now we're going to learn here that the mitzvah of telling the story also applies to your slaves. Remember the slaves are the Canaanite slaves who were part of his family. And he said to his slave, If a master frees his slave and he gives him gold, um, gold and silver, my what does the Eved need to say? What does the slave need to say? Right? What does he do? Classic good teacher. He picks an example from that person's life. He's a slave. So he knows what it's like to want to be free. So he tries to make him think about it in his terms in a way he can relate. He says, oh, he needs to thank him and praise him. So Rav Nachman responds and says, you now exempted me from saying manishtana. So he started with avadimayinu. First of all, you see here, already in the time of the Amoraim, next thing was avadimayinu. And like, like with us, you see a bunch of interesting things here. First of all, there were never questions asked here, if you notice. The questions are not because they're questions and questions have to be asked. What's the point of the questions? It's to get people engaged. He came up with an alternate way to get people engaged. His way was to kind of put it into terminology that he would understand and uh, have him have a visual of, you know, a, a way of understanding it. Once he did that, there's no reason for questions. It's interesting. It's not that the questions are so important. It's that's the way to get people engaged. And he got people engaged in a different manner. Okay, new Mishnah. Rabban Gamliel Hayaomer. This Mishnah is going to totally sound familiar to you, hopefully, because this is in the text of our Haggadah. Rabban Gamliel would say, We say this at the end of Magid. Anyone who didn't say the following things on Pesach does not fulfill his obligation. These are the three things, the Pesach sacrifice, the Matzah, and the Maru. Now, I want you just to think before we move on, which is, 
Do you think that Rabban Gamliel wanted his statement to be said the way it's said, the way we read it in our Mishnah? Probably not. This is a halachic Mishnah. This isn't one of these descriptive Mishnahs like they pour the second cup and then the child asks, and this is what he asks. Rabban Gamliel is telling you that if in the context of you telling the story, again, it's giving rules. These are the rules. When you're telling a story, make sure not to leave off, right? Like a checklist. Make sure you talk about matzah. Make sure you talk about maro. Make sure you talk about the pesach. Those are three basics that have to happen. But again, this became part of the text of the Haggadah over time. We don't know at what point it did, but it became part of the text and people say it. So, so here he tells us why you have to say these three things. Pesach, Hashum, and again, he's explaining it to you as a halacha, but it actually becomes a text. Pesach Hashum Shapasach Hamakom Abatei Avotenu B'Mitzrayim, right? Pesach because God passed over the houses of our fathers in Egypt. Shneimar v'Amartem Zevach Pesach Hula Hashem Asher Pesach, as the pasuk says. And I told you the Zevach Pesach is because Asher Pesach. You're quoting verses say God passed over. So because we're not reading the verses in Shmot, they want to make sure you get to these verses because these are the basic verses of the holiday. Matzah, and, and if you ask any kid, right, these are things that everybody ends up learning. These are the basics. Matzah shum shenigalu avotenu mimitzchayim. The matzah is for the redemption because shenemal vayofu tabatzeka sherutziu mimitzchayim. They bake their matzah, right, their dough, as they were getting out of Egypt, and they didn't have time for it to rise, and therefore, right, the famous matzah. Maror. What's the maror for? Al shum shemeruru hamitzrim et chayav avotenu mimitzchayim. It's because they embittered our lives in Egypt. Shenemar, and here we see there's a connection of the same root, Merorim, Vayimaruru et Chayehem. This is in the beginning of the, of the book of Shmot. It says that the, the Egyptians embittered our lives. So they see, they take this connection of the Marur. Okay, if you were in the skills class this week, I discussed that there's a possible different reason where Breuer says that the Pesach Matzah and Marur are actually the way they would eat, why they eat them all together, because they would eat them that's how they ate meat in general. Meat was eaten with a bitter herb and with matzah or bread. It was normally eaten with bread, right? Also sacrifices are often brought with bread. With Usually it's not chametz bread, it's matzah. Okay, like the nazir comes with bread and, and other sacrifices come with bread. The korban toda we've seen comes with bread. Again, matzah like bread, most of them. But right, the korban toda is one element that's actually not not matzah, it's, it's chametz, most of them come with some sort of bread element and that the maror goes with that. But in addition, these have symbolic meaning. So even if you say that's the reason, the real ultimate reason was to make the meat taste better. And it was a better, like, uh, as he, he, Rob Royer puts it in Perkei Moadot, he has a very interesting article about it, about it's a suudat melachim, like a meal of kings. That's what kings eat with, right? If you go to a restaurant, you eat steak, it comes with vegetables, you get Bread in the beginning of your meal, right? That's the way to eat at a king's meal. And that's what we're supposed to be having, a king's feast. Whereas, but it also, these things take on significance. Behold over, and this, this is also something we discussed at the, at the, um, the skills class, that there's this idea, some of the freshmen even talk about it, that the Seder, and I see you writing Naomi about, it's, it's essential, it's, it's a, you're doing all sorts of actions, okay? It's not just about telling the story. The question is, what if you can't speak? Are you able to fulfill the mitzvot of telling the story? And some of the Mepharshim say, I brought in a commentary, I can't remember now who said it, but that, that you actually can fulfill your obligation just by eating these things, because that's part of telling the story. These, they're so symbolic that they tell the story even without being able to speak. Bechol dor vador chayav adam. Now we're continuing to describe. This is, again, a descriptive mishnah of the laws. This is what one needs to do. But again, this got put exactly word for word into our Seder into our Haggadah. In every generation, you need to view yourself as if you got out of Egypt. As it says, you're supposed to tell your children this, right? Every year you say, God said this to me. How can you possibly tell your children God did this to me? He didn't do it to me. But no, you're supposed to view yourself as if he did it to you. Therefore, since that night, we're supposed to see ourselves as if, in fact, the Rambam has the nusach leharotetatzmo, right? To really make yourself feel it, right? To, to do whatever you can. And this is why I encourage you to engage in conversations about what it means to be slaves, what it means to be free, to understand how we got out of Egypt. So, therefore, if we, got, if we feel ourselves that we got out of Egypt, 
what do you need to do when you when you're saved? Exactly what Rabbi Nachman said. You have to thank and praise. So normally we say halal only during the day, but at the seder we say it at night, and therefore it says lefiha hanachu chayavim lahodot l'shabach. Uh, sorry, lahodot lahalel l'shabach l'peir l'ramim l'adir l'berach l'aleu l'kalais. This is already sounding more prayer like because it's got all the right. It's, you don't need to repeat yourself if you're just telling this is what you're supposed to do. But one is supposed to, and we've seen this in our prayers many times in, in Ishtabach and right where they, in Baruch Shamar, where they bring all sorts of words of praise. At the end of Hallow, we say these kind of words. We have to praise and, and glorify and all these words over and over. It's kind of the same word, meaning each one a little bit different. To the one who gave us all these, did all these miracles for us. What did he do? He took us out of slavery and into freedom, from struggling to happiness, from being in mourning to celebrating, from darkness to great light, from um, being subjug subjugated to redemption. And then we will say before you, hallelujah. What does that mean? We say hallel. Now, what hallel do we say? What part of Hallel, if you remember, we say part of Hallel before at the end of Magid, and then part of it we say at the end after we've already said bench, we benched. So we're kind of a zone. So at Hechan Huomer, here there's a big machlok at Beit Shammai Beit Hillel. Beit Shammai Omrim at Enabo Nim Smecha. You only say the first paragraph of Hallel now. Ubeit Hillel Omrim Al Chalamish the Mino Mayim. You actually say the first two paragraphs. And that's what we do. We say the first two paragraphs and then we say the rest after. Vichotem Be Geula. And then you finish with the Bracha of Geula, redemption. What's the Bracha of redemption? There's machlok at Rabbi Tarf and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Tarfan, I want you to notice all the characters here, by the way. They're all living in the generation after the Chorban, after the destruction. And I, I, I uh, recommend Shuli Mishkin's article from today, Flashback, all about, she says, imagine yourselves that you're living in the year 71, the year after the destruction of the temple. Your Seder until now has always been in the temple, right? We've discussed how different it was then. They didn't have everything that we have. They weren't even necessarily with their families, right? Sometimes just the men came and the women were at home. And they would bring their sacrifices and that was what their day was filled with and their night was filled with eating the sacrifice and all of a sudden you're living you have no sacrifice what do you do you know imagine yourself in that year that's how she starts her article so i recommend you read it and 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 she talks about that all the rabbis that are being that are discussing are specifically the rabbis living in the generation after because they have to develop what do we do in place of what we used to have so let's see what they say. Rabbi Tarfon says, who redeemed us and redeemed our fathers in Egypt. Again, you, you talk about yourself as if you were redeemed. His blessing was this blessing, and that was the end. He didn't have a starting with Baruch and ending with Baruch. But Rabbi Akiva, I omel, no, you say much more. You say, this is them after the Chorban. God, you should bring us back to have many holidays where we can do it in your city and rejoice with you. He wants to remember how it was and say, we want to go back to that. We want to be eating from the Psachim and Minas Bachim. By the way, there's a different Nusach here, whether it's Minas Bachim or Minas Bachim or Minas Bachim or Minas Bachim. And in fact, I've seen in Haggadahs where they have it in parentheses and it's unclear what the version is. And it comes from here because it's unclear what the version of the Mishnah is. Baruch Hashem, Ad Baruch Hashem Ga'al Yisrael. Ad means until, meaning you can add more, and then you end with a bracha different from Rabbi Tarfon. You didn't end with a bracha. You say at the end, Baruch Hashem Ga'al Yisrael. So now we're going to start with the Gemara on this very long Mishnah. At some point you have to say, and we were redeemed. You have to really not just view yourselves as if you got out, but say the words, we were redeemed. Amarava, and he says also when you're talking about the Matzah, the Maror, and the Pesach, Matzah, Tzarich Lagbiya, you need to raise up. Maror, Tzarich Lagbiya, you need to raise it up. This is what we do when we talk, when we say, we recite Rabban Gamliel. Basal ein Tzarich Lagbiya, but you don't lift up the meat that's re representative of the Korban Pesach. Why is this? It's going to look like you're eating a sacrifice outside the temple. Now you tell me, you're sitting at your Seder, you lift up that shank bone. You're going to, people are going to think you're doing a sacrifice? No way. But that's because we're living so many generations after sacrifices that we can't even imagine sacrifices. But imagine yourself living a number of generations after when there was still a temple, there was still people talking about it. 
maybe there was a concern and people maybe around them were having more, were still sacrificing things. So there, there was more of a concern and you can understand it more in that context. Now, obviously this halacha stayed, even though it's not really so long, so relevant anymore. But again, that's very common. Our last section for today is going to be about a blind person. Is he obligated to say the Haggadah or not? I talked before about someone who can't speak, right? That would be more of an issue. It's interesting that they say maybe a blind person is not obligated, and we'll see what they say about it. Amar of Achab Yaakov, Suma Pator Milamar Haggadah. Blind person is Pator from saying the Haggadah. He's exempt. Now, a Suma, a blind person, is exempt from many mitzvot. So, you know, this could be part of it. We're going to see why they say specifically a blind person. There's always a question. Is blind person obligated? Not so, where does he get this from? It says, and that's what you're supposed to tell your son. Because of this. Now, often means you're pointing to something. And where else do we see? is in If your son goes off the path and eats a lot and drinks a lot, and the parents bring him to the Beit Hamikdash uh, to the Sanhedrin, and they say right? And lo he doesn't listen to his parents' voice. One of the things they learn there, there's all sorts of criteria how he becomes a Ben Sorei what needs to be in place, what needs to have happened. One of the things is because it says Benenuzet, the parents have to point to him. Now you can only point to your son if you can see your son. So if you're blind, if the parents are blind, he can't become a Ben Sorero Moret. So now they say, just like there, Malahalam Prat the Suma, the Zet comes to exclude a blind person. Afkan Prat the Sumin here also comes to exclude blind people. Kamara doesn't like this and says, Eni, is that really true? Bahamar Maremar, didn't Maremar say, Shaltinu le Rabbanan de Rav Yosef? I asked the rabbis in the house of Rav Yosef. Now, Rav Yosef was blind and so was Rav Sheshet. So what did he do? He went and asked, who does the Seder of Rav Yosef's house? He couldn't imagine. Rav Yosef sitting in his house, he's not going to run the Seder. We already saw yesterday, there was one person who ran the Seder. Remember, we only take off the table of his table, not everyone else's. So who does it? Manda Amar, right? Manda Amar Agadetad Bey Rav Yosef. Who, right? The rabbis who were living in Rav Yosef's house, he asked him, who does the Seder there? Amru, Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef does it, even though he's blind. Man da Amar Agadita Be Rav Sheshet. Who says it in the house of Rav Sheshet? Amr Rav Sheshet. So what do they say? How do we explain that? According to what Rav Idi Bar Acha said, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov said, Kasavri Rabbanan Matzav is Manas Ebi Da Rabbanan. Okay, so they say Ah, they must have held that Matzav is Manas Ebi Da Rabbanan, and therefore the eating of the Matzav, the talking about the Matzav, all that is only rabbinic, and therefore they said the Suma is not exempt. The Suma is exempt from the Oraita. But this isn't Dora, right? So this is only Dorabana. So then they say, wait a minute. Michlal, you want to infer from here. Now we already talked about this. This machloket. Is Mata Dorait or Dorabadan? Bismanase when there's no longer a temple in place. Because there's no longer, remember, it says Almatsoda Muru Michlu, you have to eat it with Matzah and Maru. So Michlal, you're going to infer from here that Rabacha Bar Yaakov, who held that the Summa can't do it, must hold Matzah's Doraita. Well, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be by Torah law. He's the one we're going to see on Daf Kufchat. He's the one who holds Matzah as Rabbanan. So it doesn't make any sense. So they say, oh no. When the rabbis instituted their rabbinic law, they did it exactly as the Torah law was. So they made it exactly the same way. So that's why the Sum is going to be exempt, even though it's only rabbinic. So then the Rav Shesh, the Rav Yosef Nami, Havadai, called the Tikkun Rabbanan, can't write the Tikkun. They must hold by the same thing. So when the rabbi said Matzah is still, still a law, even though it's only rabbinic, it should have the same criteria. So you weren't obligated if you were blind when it was Torah law. You shouldn't be obligated to rabbinic law. So we're back to square one. So they say, okay, we're going to go reject the beginning premise, the whole Xerah Shabbat that he made. Hachi Hashdai, you can't compare Ben Sorero Moret to here. Why not? Bishlamaha Tami Davale Lemichta Benenu Hu. They should have said this son, uh, our son is, okay? Instead, it said this son, and they, right? Which ze means we're pointing. By the way, ze pointing comes up, they say that Moshe showed, that God showed Moshe exactly how it was supposed to look. We see that whole thing about pointing in a number of other places. But hacha ilav avor ze my lichtov. There's no other word. They couldn't have just said ba'avor. They needed to say ba'avor something. So, it must come to say 
because of the matzah maror, by the way, some people explain this differently. Because of what happened, you have to eat matzah maror. Or because of the matzah maror, this is what we do. So therefore, we're going to say here that this idea of the whole, it, it's basically a drasha. We only darshan a word if, it, if it's not the basic word that was needed in that text. If we use some strange word, then right in Ben Saramur, we could have used a different word. Here, there was no other word to use, so we can't darshan it because it's just, there's no other way to say the verse if we don't say ba'avor zeh. And therefore, they don't have that drasha and they don't exclude blind people from being obligated for the Haggadah. And I believe that that's how we passed in, that blind people are obligated to say the Haggadah. Okay, with that, we will finish for today and we're gonna move on to Hallel tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.